We are partnering with NoCD to raise awareness about OCD. OCD is more than what you see on TV and in the movies. Imagine having unwanted thoughts about your relationship stuck in your head all day, no matter how hard you try to make them go away. That's relationship OCD. It comes with unrelenting, intrusive images, thoughts, and urges about your partner or loved one. Breaking the OCD cycle takes effective treatment. Go to nocd.com to get evidence-based treatment. So today I'm talking with Dr. Heather Taylor, who is a psychologist out in the state of Washington. And I want to formally welcome her to the show, Bossing Up, Overcoming OCD. And Heather, I want to thank you. Or Do you want me to call you Heather or Dr. Taylor? Oh my gosh. Okay. Yes. Call me Heather. <laughs> yes. So Heather and I have known each other for quite a while and we've been like working together virtually on all things podcasting and building a private practice that's based on values. And so Heather, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm so excited for my audience to hear more about you and your podcast on grief. Hi, I'm Erin, licensed clinical mental health counselor and OCD specialist. I'm also a Christian, wife, mom to three, and small business owner, helping those who are overwhelmed by stress to climb out of that valley and enjoy the view. Reheat your coffee and pop in your AirPods to learn how to boss up to OCD. So if you would, take a second and tell us about your podcast and where we can find it. Absolutely. Like Erin said, I'm Dr. Heather Taylor. I am a licensed psychologist based out of Washington State. So think Apple, not Capital. And yes, I am a super passionate clinician about grief. And so I decided to take that passion and put it into a podcast to try to start changing the conversation about what grief can look like and how it's experienced and not have to do it in this isolation or linear state. And we'll flesh those concepts out a little bit more as Erin and I talk. I'm very excited to be here and honored that Erin, you'd have me on your podcast. And I just, you're such a great clinician and you are such a good voice for OCD and getting the right kind of help for the, with the right kind of treatment. I just admire what you do. So I'm really excited oh, to be here. Thank you, Heather. Yes. And listening to your podcast, it sounds like you're really trying to change the conversation around grief. I'm curious with your work and with your therapy practice and even teaching college students, what have been some of those like common misconceptions that people have about grief? Yeah. So on my podcast, sorry, I forgot, realized I forgot to mention the name. It's called Grief is the New Normal podcast. It's on Spotify and Apple, and I'm trying to get it on a couple other stations. And yes, yeah, so when you think about common misconceptions about grief, so many people want to put it in a box. They want it to be small because grief is painful. And so we try to lean away from it instead of leaning into it. When Kubler-Ross, she's one of the big researchers, came out with the five stages of mm -hmm. grief. Breathing, she presented it like it was this linear progression of emotions. So you start with denial, then bargaining, then anger and depression, and then acceptance. What's really confusing about that is our emotions don't actually occur in a line. They are more like a cyclone or a cesspool. Right. Like you don't know which emotion is going to bubble up next because it's it changes on the day, the week, the, the season, the time of year, the holiday, the developmental age and stage, the relationship you had with the person, all of those things are different factors that contribute to how you're going to process your grief experience. Mm -hmm. And yeah, do you have any questions or comments about that? No, I mean, I'll start I've got plenty of questions for you, but okay. yeah, it's, Okay. So that's probably one of the most common ones is the myth that grief is linear and mm -hmm. it's not. And then the other piece, there's no time limit on Good grief. Point. So you think these stages are linear and that, oh, well, I'll be in bargaining for four to six weeks and then I'm going to move into anger and by Christmas I'll be in acceptance. And that's such a misconception. There's 
they, they just swirl around each other. They're in these different circles and we go through them over and over again. A metaphor I use often with my clients is of waves. Mm -hmm. And I know people use waves for lots of different things and in grief, it's no exception, right? So say you have, this is you, and then you're standing on the beach and then suddenly this storm just starts rolling in and it's these big waves, big highs, big lows, and they're just hitting you over and over again. Mm -hmm. And the highs are really high, the lows are really low, and it just feels like they're nonstop. And what happens over time is it's almost like someone's taking their fingers at the end of each of the waves and they're pulling them out. They're stretching and lengthening them. So the waves don't stop. Mm. Like the grief keeps coming. It's more like the acuity of the waves is lessened over time. And so it doesn't feel as painful over time. That doesn't mean it's going to stop though. The grief doesn't go away. We're not going right. to just suddenly wake up and be like, oh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm cured. That's not realistic. And that's an unfair, I think, expectation we put on ourselves and maybe on the people who are grieving around us. Right. Right. Yeah. And so in these misconceptions about grief, it's like people want to put it in a box as if they can just close the lid, forget about it. And then it's also going to be the straight line of emotions and one thing after the other. Mm -hmm. And really grief can show up at any point at any time and with any type of emotion. And it can feel like a yeah. lot of waves, a lot of ebbs and flows, highs and lows. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, think about how society does bereavement leave. It's three days, like, sorry, you lost your mom. Here's three days off work. Come back and just keep firing on all yeah, cylinders. Yeah, we'll see you Monday. <laughs> see uh -huh. you Monday. So sorry. Yeah. And I think it, the way our culture does grief is just so limited and it just doesn't take into account the intense pain, the disorientation, the brain fog. I mean, those first three to six weeks, you're still just in shock and numb and you're forgetting things. You're disoriented. It's just, it's hard to make decisions because you're having decision fatigue from all of the paperwork or processor funerally type dis memorial decisions you're having to make. And you're just burned out from those, let alone alone adjusting to this new world you're living in where someone you have an emotional attachment to is no longer physically right. here. Right. With folks who are experiencing a loss and they're going through some grief, how do you recommend to them that they work through that or cope with the situation? Yeah. Like I know everyone experiences grief differently, but what are some of those like more effective or possibly like standard of care type of recommendations that you give for the bereaved? Yeah, I, I think I, my students tease me all the time because I always say it depends. And so this is one of those it depends situations. Mm -hmm. It's going to depend on the relationship you had with the person. So some loss is really complicated and maybe you didn't have a great relationship with that person. So you're going to want to be able to process that loss differently because it's not going to impact you in the same way as losing a partner or losing a child or a sibling or a parent or a grandparent or a coworker. Like those different relationships are going to influence the type of support that you're going to need after the loss. And then grief is also on a spectrum. And so some people are more of an instrumental grief on one side. It's more of that stoic, reserved, internal processing, thinking about it a lot versus the more emotive type grief, which is the externalized mm -hmm. verbal processing, outwardly tearful type of grief. And so being able to show up in a therapy space with clinicians who understand mm -hmm. that spectrum of grief and that you're going to fall in different places on that spectrum depending on the day or different family members are going to show up differently and that gets to be okay too so we're not playing the grief comparison oh, interesting. game Yes. So like, say you lose a caregiver or one of the parent figures and there's three kids and two of them are emoters and one of them instrumental. So one of them is going to be super stoic and quiet and reserved. The other two are going to be super outwardly tearful. Yeah. And it's like that there's going to be comparison and confusion. Am I grieving so true. wrong? Why does my grief look different? Am I doing it wrong? When really there's not one right or wrong way mm -hmm. to grieve. And I think that's the point of your question is there's not one right or wrong way to grieve. And I think because we're so behind in a lot of evidence-based treatments for mm -hmm. grief, there isn't just one specific modality that's going to be 
the best. It's going to be you and a good therapeutic fit with your clinician because 70% of therapeutic change is based right. on the fit. So you need a clinician who's not afraid to say your person's mm -hmm. name, who's going to let you go at your own pace, isn't going to rush you through your grief or avoid talking about it. Um, because clinicians, we aren't trained to do grief in graduate school. I had to go out and find it on my own. I volunteered with hospice and did bereavement trainings and I was a vigil volunteer. I really wanted to understand grief, let alone with my own lived right. experience. So I just, I think there's not necessarily one right modality. So find a clinician that's a good fit for you and then work within that modality around your grief. And that's going to be a good right. fit. Okay. So then in this instance, when someone is dealing with grief or maybe even a more complicated grief. It's going to depend on who they lost, the relationship they had with that person. And if they're having a lot of struggles, they need to find a therapist who's the right fit for them. Yes. 110% yeah, agree. Absolutely. And grief support groups are also mm -hmm. really helpful. And so many are virtual these days. Yeah. So you can find people who've maybe had a similar type loss because someone who had the slow goodbye loss, like with a cancer diagnosis or chronic illness is going to grieve differently than someone who had a traumatic loss or had a disenfranchised type of grief, like death by suicide or substance use or their complicated relationships. Mm -hmm. So those different types of loss are going to want a different group vibe. Yeah. And the other thing that is changing the way for grief, and it may seem very minimal, but having grief as a diagnosis in our diagnostic book. So yeah. with that being said, like with OCD, I mean, you won't believe it. Like insurance is just now coming around to find it as a quote unquote reimbursable diagnosis, even though OCD is so debilitating and limiting, it's just now being recognized yeah. by insurance as like a medical illness that needs treatment as, oh, that's shocking yes. to me. So anyway, I'm curious, Heather, is the complicated grief diagnosis, is it reimbursable by insurance or have you noticed what's been your experience with that? Yeah. So to, in the DSM, it's prolonged grief disorder and you actually can't diagnose it until it's been 12 months since <gasps> the loss. Whoa. Yes. So it's the adjustment disorder with mixed depression and anxiety. And if it's been six months and there's maybe some of those major depressive disorder symptomology or more of a generalized anxiety disorder presentation, because maybe there's a hyper fixation on one's own mortality, then that might be a better diagnostic mm -hmm. fit. Or maybe they weren't even seeing you for grief and they just happen to experience a loss right. while already in therapy for something else from an insurance reimbursement standpoint, I've used it, but I have to have been working with someone for over a year for it to qualify. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So again, just areas where our system is yeah. lacking and needs better education and awareness to better support humans. <laughs> yes. And another thing along the lines of it depends, I'm curious to hear how grief can show up in those different life stages, like for kids, sure. teens, and adults. Like I foresee that it can be very different. So what have you noticed about how grief manifests in all those different life stages? Great question. We could do a whole episode just on grief in child and adolescence. So one of my, so kids are actually my favorite grievers. I know that's going to sound really weird and I have a reason for it. So there's a visualization that I like to use. I'm sure you're familiar with like old school oscillating mm -hmm. kitchen fans, like the little white ones that were in your grandma's kitchen, they're standing and they just yeah. go zoom, zoom, back and forth. Yes. So that's one of the best parts of grief work is learning how to be an oscillating kitchen fan. You're oscillating between grief work and restorative work. So the grief work is that the dark, the hard, the naming, the feelings, the remembering, the doing rituals, things like that, that are helping you feel connected to your loved one. And then you oscillate into the restorative work. And that's like self care and movement and daily hygiene and connecting and socializing the things that help you keep wanting to live the, the light. And so kids are brilliant at this. I be working with a mom and her five-year-old will come in and be like, I'm really sad. I'm miss dad. Can I have a popsicle? 
And it's like, oh, yeah. the kids just automatically know that, okay, I named my feeling. I'm full. I've hit my max that I can say about my grief. I'm going to go do something life-giving, something restorative. Like, I want a pop school. Or I'm going to go play with my Legos. That's totally normal and developmentally appropriate. Wow. They're not doing anything yeah. wrong. The mom is crushed. Like, okay, they said they're sad, but then they want to go play with toys. Are they being dismissive? Is something wrong? It's like, no, they just have awareness that they've hit the limit. And then they need to go and do something off. to self-care and soothe and yeah. they're off. And so I think young kids do that pretty well. If they have a hard time finding that balance, that's where you want to probably bring in some outside support. If they're really stuck in the sad or they're really stuck in the not talking about the grief stuff because it stays in our bodies, mm -hmm. right? We learned that from Bessel van der Kolk's Body Keeps the Score and True. all of that. Our bodies remember all of that grief stuff. And so if we don't process out the pain, metabolize it out, it's going to just stay there. And that can lead to more of the chronic health stuff. And then like with teenagers, who are they looking to relate to? They're looking to relate to their peers. They're not looking to relate to adults. And so put like giving them the opportunity to be in a peer aged grief mm. support group is going to be really helpful um, because they're wanting to not feel othered. Because when you're a teen, you want to fit in with your friends. And if you're experiencing a significant loss, that's going to make you feel different. And it's also maybe going to make you have less tolerance for more superficial teenage things. Like, I just lost my dad and my best friend is crying about not finding the right prom dress. Yeah. Like, how, like, how does that, I feel like my friends just don't get it. I feel unseen. So having awareness that they're not necessarily looking to adults for validation. They're looking to their friends. So how can we give them opportunities right. to connect with similar age Yes. I could friends. see where a teen grief group would be helpful because they're all going through the same thing. Whereas your day-to-day -day friends, they're afraid to talk about it or don't know what to say. Yeah. So before we get into the next set of questions, let's take a break and hear a word from our sponsor. We're partnering with NoCD to raise awareness about OCD. OCD is more than what you see on TV and in the movies. Imagine having unwanted thoughts about your relationship stuck in your head all day, no matter how hard you try to make them go away. That's relationship OCD. It comes with unrelenting, intrusive images, thoughts, and urges about your partner or loved one. If you think you may be struggling with relationship OCD, there's hope. NoCD offers effective, affordable, and convenient OCD therapy. NoCD therapists are trained in exposure response prevention therapy, the gold standard treatment for OCD. With NoCD, you can do virtual, live, face-to-face -face video sessions with one of their licensed specialty trained therapists. It's affordable and they accept most major insurance plans. Breaking the relationship OCD cycle takes effective treatment. To get started with NoCD, go to nocd.com slash savage. Okay, we were talking about the teen grief group and how that's very helpful for mm. kids who are going through loss and how your day-to-day -day friends may be avoidant or not know what to say. So my next question was, how do you support your friend? Yeah. One of the most important takeaways about how to support our people when they're grieving is remembering we can't fix it. This is not something where you're going to have a magic phrase, a magic Valid. wand, a magic casserole that's going to just suddenly make a this situation casserole. okay. <laughs> so true. I mean, how many times have you shown up to someone's house and it's like, I've never seen so many casseroles in my life. Don't get me wrong. Bring yes. the food. The food is helpful because we're forgetting to eat when we're in those early yeah. grief stages. So the casseroles are helpful, but it's not going to yes. fix it. It's not going to fix no the fairy situation. Like there. someone has died. There's no fairy dust in there. there someone yeah. has died. Like that's hard and painful. In our culture, we are very fix it oriented. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if I just keep pushing through, if I just do this, if I just do this, if I follow this plan, then I'm going to get over yeah. it. And it's like, this isn't something to get over. It's something to learn how to move through in a way that feels good. And so I think if you're going to show up for people in a season of grief, remember that you can't okay. fix it. So just showing up is enough. Send the text. I'm thinking of you. How are you in this right. moment? Not like, how's it going? Like it's going crappy. That's how the, that's the automatic thought, right? It's not going good. Like someone I love just died. It's not right. good. But how am I in this moment? I might be okay. I might 
be watching a show. I might have showered today. That's right. positive. So send the text, still show up, just have limited expectations. Someone made a really funny grief meme based on the new Mean Girls coming yeah. out. I don't know if you remember if you were a Mean yes. Girls fan, but it was like, get in loser, we're going to the mall. Be that friend, show up at their house. Hey, get in, we're going to go get coffee. Aww, you know, yeah. you're at the grocery store. Hey, I'm buying dinner. Can I bring you a bag of groceries? Are you home? I'm stopping by. Force your presence so that people will right. feel more comfortable to invite you into their grief space. Yeah, such a good point. And it reminds me of some of the ladies I've worked with. They've experienced grief in the sense of a hysterectomy. And so mm. the loss yeah. of not having children and the grief that brought and how society is not comfortable in talking about the loss of what never came. Yeah. And yep. yeah, these ladies talk about how it was so isolating and it felt invalidating that no one ever named their loss or said anything directly about sorry for your experience or what your family's going through. So that yeah. severed some friendships for them. Grief really extends into so many areas of life from what I've seen. And it sounds like you have the same mindset as well. It's better to say something, just be direct and straightforward and Honestly, go in there with good intentions and a good heart. Yeah. Well, and no, you don't have to say the perfect thing yes. because it's not a perfect situation. Yes. It's okay to be messy in this messy oh, space. Oh, I love that. It's okay to be messy. Yes. And I mean, with your gals who had hysterectomies, it's that's one of those non-death losses, oh, yeah. right? And so there's a disenfranchisement there. There's a lack of validity. And it's, I just want someone to name mm -hmm. it. Think of the relief we feel when someone says, how are you doing with Sally's mm -hmm. loss? What was one of your favorite memories with right. Sally? And like how good that feels when someone asks us because it's our responsibility to carry their names now that they're no longer physically here. And when people ask us about them, there's space to be for them to be remembered. That feels so good and that someone cares enough to mm -hmm. ask. So say their names, send the text bring the food. Right. I'm curious too about your advice for people who might be really struggling after a loss as far as finding their meaning and purpose in life, because it seems like it's a very common human experience whenever we lose someone who's very close to us. And they're like, what's the point? They're in that very deep depressive state and they're hopeless. So what is your yeah. work with people who are in that space? Yeah. So, you know, there's this set of common grief reactions we work with and we have physical reactions, emotional, mental, social, behavioral, and then spiritual existential. And within that category are those, what's the point of all of this? How do I make meaning from mm -hmm. this? What's my purpose now? Everything I was doing felt superficial and now I've had this loss and it really heightens that. Like, how do I pivot? How do I do something different? So when we experience a, a loss, it can have a world altering shift on us. It brings to light the things of importance and that have weight and we can help support our clients feel empowered to maybe choose a different path. So I experienced my loss about 14 and mm. a half years ago. I lost my younger brother quite traumatically. Oh, sorry to hear that. Thank you. I was applying to go to school to be a librarian. So I was trying to get my master's in library science and I'm at the same time trying to find my own grief mm -hmm. therapist. And I had such a frustrating experience. I went through three different clinicians. Wow. One of them made me watch VHS oh, tapes. Right. On from like Clown and Townsend, Fantastic. like their grief books. I'm like, okay, oh. this doesn't feel like this fits. Like another one would never say their name. Wouldn't say oh. my brother's name. Like we talk about everything except for my grief, which was literally I bet the, the air felt there. thick. Cause you can tell when <sighs> yeah. there's something not being said. Yes. Well, and I, it was my first experience with therapy. So I didn't know what I was doing so or true. what to expect. Yeah. I didn't realize it was not a good fit. And then I don't even remember why the third one didn't work out. I still just remember the VHS tapes. And I was just like, <laughs> anyway, so I got, I was really frustrated. I was like, fine, I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to become a grief yeah. therapist. I'm 14 and a half years out from that. I volunteered with hospice. I did vigil volunteering. I did every single project in grad school on grief. Like I was the grief girl in my cohort. Just that's, that's what's energized mm -hmm. me, what I'm passionate about because culturally we just 
do grief so bad. So I think yeah. to go back, yeah. we do. And I'm, we're try, I'm trying to help yes. voice change There's, to do grief differently. It's to coming. Better. Yeah. I feel the yeah. momentum and the waves of positivity coming yeah. where we're going to be talking about this more. And so it sounds like, Heather, with your experience, you used your loss as a way and a meaning. You found meaning and purpose by trying to help others. So it's yes. not that everyone yes. needs to I be mean, a grief therapist or a grief specialist. No, yeah. not at all. Grief can be such a powerful motivator to try to create better situations for those that come after right. us. One of my colleagues, she did her dissertation on a woman who founded a foundation after the loss of her child. And it was based on their experience with that disease. We have all these different walks for different diseases, chronic illnesses, conditions, and things. A lot of people do find meaning by trying to make things better for others. Mm -hmm. Also, it's okay if you need to think smaller than that. Like when I'm feeling really stuck or working with a client who's really stuck in their grief, I pull on Casey Davis. She wrote the How to Keep House While Drowning. So good. If you're neurodivergent, yes. it's an excellent read. And it's just look around your room. What are five things that I can pick up? And just if that feels too many, okay, what are three things that I can pick up? Okay, what's one thing that I can pick up? just to start building some momentum to help again, moving forward because grief, it wants us to feel stuck wow. and isolated and alone. So many parallels grief, she's kind of with changed. OCD too. I know. And so being creative, having those support people that will text you to help kind of, Hey, have you showered yeah. today? Who are those safe people to send right. you that text to ask? Because that's such a simple act. And yet for so many people, I mean, and I know you know this from your OCD work, like a shower can be a really big yeah. thing that we build up in our heads. And if we're already feeling stuck and hopeless, like that can feel insurmountable. Yeah. So who are our safe people to help us? And those that? safe people that will celebrate those wins with you. Yeah. Yeah. So when someone is experiencing those challenges and getting those day-to-day -day or daily responsibilities accomplished, it sounds like having people in your corner to help encourage you, maybe keep you accountable in a loving way. Absolutely. Loving, not punishing right. or shaming. Yes. Yes. And in a way that is going to help you feel like you accomplished something and they're going to say, I'm proud of you for just going out. Yeah. You don't worry about your yeah. hair or your makeup. Just go out, girl. Yeah. How about the self-care? What are some things that the individual person can do? Let's say it's an adult, right? They're a little bit more aware and recognize the need for self-care. I've already published the episode on self-care with Mother's Day and everything. What are your ideas about self-care for people who are grieving? Yeah. I mentioned earlier, kind of those common grief reactions. I have a cool handout. I'll send it to you. And if you want to put it in the okay. show notes, because it's a really helpful tool, there's the six different categories of how grief can manifest. So I think coming up with self-care tools, depending on which category your grief is showing That's up in the cool. most. So if you're having a lot more physical manifestation of grief, so lots of body aches, tension, GI stuff, fatigue, then maybe I'm going to take an extra long bath or do some aromatherapy or go to bed two hours earlier because my body just needs some more sleep. So things like that, that are addressing the physical needs versus someone whose grief is showing up socially where they're withdrawing, they're not feeling connected to anyone. They feel othered. Okay. So maybe self-care is I'm going to text that safe friend for a cup of coffee, or I'm going to have those three people on standby. Cause I used to call my mom when I'd get in the car and now I don't have someone to call when I get in the car. And so I need my three safe friends that I can just call and they're going to answer because I'm in the car and I'm working through losing yeah. my mom. So that's, that can be self-care too. It doesn't have to just be going to the spa or going to retail yeah. therapy. Like those aren't necessarily self-care. It's okay. I'm going to make myself a special coffee in the morning because that helps me get out of bed. That's going to be my self-care for the morning. So having different ideas for the different categories can be mm -hmm. really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can you explain what it means when someone feels othered? So when someone is going through grief and loss, we can call it post-traumatic growth. When you're in a season of post-traumatic growth, you can feel very different 
than the people operating around you not going through a season of loss Mm. or grief. So say your loss happens around Christmas time and you have to go get eggs at the grocery store and the checkout gal is like, oh, how are you this holiday season? And like your partner Mm -hmm. just died. And it's so it's almost like a limited BS tolerance for the superficiality of others. And so you feel different. You feel othered from the general population because they're not grieving. They're not in active grief. That makes yeah, sense? It's almost like you're in a totally different headspace, a different universe. Yeah. You're living in a new world. So uh, Mary Frances O'Connor, she does a lot of brain research on grief and her studies showed that literally your brain landscape changes when you're in a season of bereavement in the memory area in cognition, like your brain is literally changed by loss. So it makes sense that we're trying to adjust to the new normal of the world around us because it just feels so different why we feel othered within it. And we're trying to figure out who am I now on the other side of this loss. We're partnering with NoCD to raise awareness about OCD. OCD is more than what you see on TV and in the movies. Imagine having unwanted thoughts about your relationship stuck in your head all day, no matter how hard you try to make them go away. That's relationship OCD. It comes with unrelenting, intrusive images, thoughts, and urges about your partner or loved one. Breaking the OCD cycle takes effective treatment. Go to NOCD.com to get evidence-based treatment. Well, Heather, thank you so much for taking the time to speak today. It was really informative and encouraging to hear about how we can help change that conversation about grief. If the audience wants to hear more about grief, they would go to your podcast on Apple or Spotify and it's called Grief is the New Normal. Yes, Grief is the New Normal podcast. And you can also follow along on Instagram, same name. And then I have a partner and we do this thing called The Morning Movement. And we are grief educators and offer webinars about understanding grief and are doing some more specialized grief workshops in the future. So stay tuned for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Erin. It was great chatting with you. All right, all right, all right. Well, I hope you all enjoy the conversation between Dr. Heather Taylor and I. Come back next week to hear about all things that get me riled up about therapy and the treatment of OCD. If you're wanting to grab a copy of Dr. Heather Taylor's handout, I will have that on my website and you can find it on my blog. And the blog title is going to be Grief is the New Normal. And I'm now announcing some open slots for people located in Virginia. That's right. If you're located in Virginia and are looking for treatment for OCD, hit me up. Go to valuedriventherapy.com and click book your consult to schedule your free 15-minute video call with me today. Thank you for listening to another episode of Falsing Up, Overcoming OCD. This information is intended to be helpful and not a substitute for professional counseling. If you're struggling with any mental health challenges, I encourage you to seek help from a qualified therapist or healthcare professional. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to rate and review the show. Your feedback helps us reach more listeners. And don't forget to check out the affiliate links in the show notes for hand-picked recommendations that can brighten your day. Your support through these links helps keep the show running and provide valuable content. You're not alone in your journey. Stay strong, stay resilient, and keep bossing up. See you next time.